You've thrown your support behind Disney, behind Bob Iger, and it looks as though, well, most of the investor base retail and some of their big shareholders are doing the same. Well, yeah, I mean, Iger's a phenomenal executive. This is, Nelson Peltz is absurd. He's wasted so much time and money. You know, he, he's made a ton of money now on this activist campaign, irrelevant of really he's going to accomplish nothing. I think Disney's going to win this, you know, pretty solidly with the backing of the institutional shareholders, um, you know, as well as many retail shareholders like we are. So the bottom line in this is how is Nelson Peltz going to do anything better for Disney other than cut costs? And, and that's already happened. Uh, Mr. Gerber, whether Mr. Peltz is absurd or not, he set out in a 133 page manifesto a lot of grievances right. focusing on the streaming business. And so let's say whatever happens, right, say uh, Iger is successful. The, the question that, that Mr. Peltz raised was how do you get that streaming business to profitability without depending on a strategy that is raising prices for consumers while cutting the costs of content production? Do you have firm in your mind an answer to that question? Shogun, that is the answer. When you have shows and you have content, that people want to see, they will pay for subscriptions. It's it's just what's happening in streaming. We're seeing it with sports subscriptions now too, where people are signing up to watch a game on Paramount Plus, and then they're sticking 60 to 70% of the time after the game's over. So the shows, the hit shows, the talent, the IP that bring viewers in is what makes these streamers profitable like Netflix. Every week, Netflix has something good on, every week. So finally, Hulu and Disney Plus are, are stepping up their game. They've combined the apps. They've built it onto one platform now. There's a tech side of this. This is a big thing that Disney's done to cut costs and make their library even more accessible to many different you know, platforms. But the bottom line is the shows drive Disney's success, and they have hit shows right now on their platforms, and that's the Iger magic that Pelts can never do. Gerber Kawasaki, your firm, according to the data on my Bloomberg terminal, 131,000 Disney shares or so. What is your firm's position on Iger succession? Well, you know, being a Disney shareholder my whole life and going through the, you know, past with, you know, Eisner and, and all the trials and tribulations, Iger is a young CEO based off the average age of a presidential candidate. So I'm not sure what will happen next. I think there's some competent executives that he can, you know, pick to take over that are hopefully more digitally focused. Um, and he's got some of the same team members around him from, you know, building Disney Plus in the past. So I'm not sure where he goes with this. Um, we'd like to see an internal succession as Disney typically does that. Um, but it's going to be really hard to find a replacement for Iger, as it's always been a big challenge for Disney over its long history. Just really quick, Carrie, the argument that Ross has made before is that if Joe Biden can run for re-election as president, then Bob Iger can do another 10 years at Disney. Oh, yeah, yeah, easily. I just, Ross, I just wanted to, to, to make it simple for the audience. Carrie, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I mean, Iger's in great shape. I mean, he's, he's mentally and physically fit and... And, you know, he's riding his bike on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m., like 20 miles. So, but you know, he's I'm shown in the past, Ross, that he wanted to exit and then he had to come back. And I think ultimately the new board has really been focused on trying to understand where the path of the future is, who are in the internal candidates, who are the external candidates. And it's got to be, yes, someone who's digitally focused. But Disney is a behemoth. It isn't just right. an exposure to digital. It's an exposure to parks, to experiences, to cruises. Right. And it's, it's an experience to, to big hit shows that go on to your movie theatres. How can we find someone who can be basically the consolidated leader of a business like this? Well, you just brought up probably one of the more challenging issues, right? Like running parks and resorts is nothing like running a streamer. And so somebody having these sort of skills to do it all is, is really a big ask. And that, hence why I heard and, and they got James Gorman on the board to try to help succession planning. But it's it's a challenge to find somebody with that type of operational expertise, like period. So what I think is Disney's really big. And when you look at the ESPN piece, that they're sort of carving into its own sort of business and then parks and resorts and experience and then, you know, the rest of the business, the streaming and the studios. I think they really need three strong leaders that are sort of have a CEO that's great at running 
those three leaders mm -hmm. because each leader is going to have to be different. And this is the problem that a lot of massive companies, whether it be Apple, Microsoft, whatever, are facing is they become so big and so profitable. Can one person really run all of this? You know, so I, I think we're, you know, this is a challenge for a lot of big companies, including Disney, is where do we go from here with succession planning? Because finding another Iger is obviously not going to happen. One reason Iger might want to hand over the baton sooner rather than later is because he's fed up with mudslinging coming from people like Elon Musk. And <laughs> it's interesting that Elon Musk has decided to pile on at the last minute saying he would support, well, Pelts joining the board. We know he's got an axe to grind against Bob Iger. What did you make of that coming? Well, hopefully Elon can keep his job as CEO of Tesla at this point, let alone making recommendations for activists. Because what's going to happen is Pelts is going to buy Tesla next and be calling the board of Tesla because an opportunity is arising for an activist in Tesla right now that looks amazing. So the best thing Elon can do is get his butt back to Tesla and start working on getting these cars out. You know, he's got to get Cybertruck out. He's got to get full self-driving working. He's got to, you know, deal with competition. And instead, he's tweeting every day a bunch of garbage. So, you know, look at the performance of Disney versus, I, I think somebody tweeted this, you know, what's the performance between Disney versus Tesla over the last six months? And fortunately, Disney's the top holding in my fund, GK. And, you know, our clients, yeah. we have very close relationships with our clients, and they love these companies. But sometimes things change, and we've had to deal with, the changes at Tesla for the negative and and for the positive, we are seeing positive changes for Disney and it's become a very good returning investment for our clients. Just give us the context on Elon Musk running Tesla, the environment with which he's running it at the moment, the response on X of basically calling out certain individuals posts, calling them idiots because the EV landscape itself is contracting. BYD sales dropped 42%. He's referring to the competition coming from China. In fact, yes, we saw a pullback in terms of dis deliveries from Tesla yesterday, but actually it reclaimed its spot as the number one provider of EVs globally. Can you respond to the criticism that Elon Musk has? Of you? Well, yeah, you know, of your are... tweet and calling you basically an idiot. idiot, idiot yeah. yeah, you know, I, I've been called that many times by Elon, but somehow, you know, I've survived this long. And we went to the same college. But that said, um, I think that if you look at global sales of EVs, it's up 35% year over year. Um, Tesla's losing share. BYD EV sales were actually up year over year. It was total sales. So it's easy to cherry pick numbers. But the EV market is growing. Only 9% of US consumers are buying EVs. So really, the truth of the matter is we can all call names and we can all look around and you know make excuses. The economy is very strong here in the United States. The economy in Europe is OK. China is definitely an issue, and it affects Tesla. But when you look at the gap between production and sales, that's not an economic issue. That's a sales issue. So once again, the guy throwing out names and all this kind of stuff because he doesn't like what people are saying about him, Mr. Free Speech, you know. But the fact of the matter is his free speech has cost Tesla shareholders $600 billion in losses. And Tesla car owners have lost $50 billion of equity in their vehicles. And he's even forced the Hertz CEO to lose his job because it was such a bad investment buying Teslas for Hertz. So let's be real, Elon. Like, it's time for you to grow up and accept reality that you're causing enormous damage to one of the most consequential companies in the world because of your behavior on Twitter. And nobody wants to hear his opinions. Right. Anymore. Uh, you know, that's a fact. Uh, Ross, I'm just sorry, Kara. I've invited Elon onto this program many times. And in this case, I'll write to him again and say, you know, Ross responded to your post on X, he can come to the show. He obviously has declined or to do that. Uh, but Throw in the U-Pen thing. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, both. listen, he's not going to debate me. He doesn't want to debate me because the fact of the matter is I'm not scared of him and he's so used to bullying everybody out of the business. He's not going to bully me. So, you know, the reality is he's got to get his focus back on what's important, which is solving climate. It's not free speech. So, okay. you know, I'm sorry.